So we've got a project underway. Uh, the wireless home broadcaster on the AM band. We have the power supply running. Starting to wire the tube sockets. And uh, got the filaments lit. Right now it's time to figure out some of the RF circuits and uh, of course the oscillator and amplifier might require some radio frequency chokes. These kind of drive people crazy because uh, They've gone up in price and a little bit hard to find. Why don't we try to build our own RFCs for this project? And uh, that's what this little video is all about. It's kind of a precursor to, uh, to bringing the stages up with the wireless broadcaster. So I'm going to breach a subject that's probably uh, of concern to some of you that like to do RF projects. And that is paying for finding these RF chokes that every project seems to require. This is a national choke from the 1950s. Um, James Milling Company made a lot of these chokes as well, and several other companies. Okay, let's look at some of these interesting uh, radio frequency chokes. Um, We've got the uh, traditional pie wound chokes. These are some different styles. Uh, this is a 2.5 millihenry uh, national choke. Millen made these as well. And uh, these are very commonly seen in some of the old circuits. Uh, then we have one of those Radio Shack 100 microhenry ferrite loaded chokes. Those are kind of nice because you can take the, uh, the heavy wire off and you can put some finer wire on there and make some pretty good receiver chokes. And uh, you're not going to saturate the core when you're only putting a milliamp or two through there. For instance, in a regen stage or a, a small oscillator or something like that. Then we have a couple of uh, television uh, peaking chokes. Um, these are color-coded. This looks like it's a 68 micro Henry choke. And this one is a 56 micro Henry choke. Uh, here's a uh, sewing machine bobbin that's got some number, uh, looks like 32 wire on it. And that's something that you might use with like one of those Morgan regens. Here's a homebrew choke. This is made out of a fiberglass rod. It's got uh, four different windings. These are done on standard, uh, just standard solenoid winding. Okay, in the bottom row we have some uh, VHF chokes. These are typically the size that uh, would give you just a few microhenries of inductance. Uh, typically you use something like this in a VHF uh, circuit maybe a super regen in the uh, 2 meter band, that kind of thing. Here's a molded choke. Looks like it's 4.7 microhenries according to the color code. Um, what do we got here? This is a heavy duty uh, 47 microhenry uh, ferrite loaded power choke that could be used in a uh, power supply like for a hash choke. Wouldn't use that for RF service. Um, here's an ohmite this is a lossy choke that probably was used in the plate of a VHF amplifier of some kind, like an 829B, something like that. Ah, here's one of those 88 millihenry uh, uh, transformers, loading transformers. Uh, here's another hash choke. This is a, looks like it's ferrite and pretty heavy wire. A hash choke is just trying to present a high impedance to uh, to high frequency noise coming through uh, DC lines in a power supply. And then finally we have some small chokes. Those look like they're, uh, you know, between 40 and uh, 100 microhenry chokes. So that's a rundown. This is what they look like. And uh, all of them have one purpose, and that is to present a high impedance between two parts of your circuit while allowing DC and low frequency AC to pass. So you'll see some with 
four pi windings, some with three, some with five, some with six, and they will vary in value from usually a half a millihenry up to about 10 millihenries. But the most common value is 2.5. This is a 2.5 millihenry uh, choke. Usually they're wound with Litz wire and they use a very fancy pi uh, winding, so you need a coil winding machine to do it like they did. Uh, they wound it in pies like this to reduce the de distributed capacitance and to eliminate much of the resonances that uh, would occur if you just put uh, a big blob of uh, wire on top of one another. Yeah, you know, if you think you paid like two dollars or two fifty for a choke like this back in the '60s, early '70s, you can imagine that today you'd be pay paying ten to fifteen dollars for the same choke. And uh, with marked up prices, some of these vintage chokes are going upwards for $25, probably $30 with shipping for a choke like this. Um, some companies are starting to uh, get in the game, and uh, you can find some chokes from companies like Mauser and DigiKey. Uh, Hammond Manufacturing is uh, making the chokes again. But you're still, with shipping, going to be in the uh, $10 to $15 range to get uh, RF chokes. So, for what we're doing with uh, simple tube circuits, you can make your own chokes. Here's a homemade choke. Okay. It's just made out of ordinary enameled wire. It's not Litz wire. This happens to be number 28 wire, so this particular choke would take probably three quarters of an amp. But um, we'll investigate and see what... Uh, what this thing does over frequency. Now how did I build it? Well I went down to the hardware store and got one of those um, driveway markers that's made of uh, fiberglass and then I cut it up and uh, you know I said okay I want to make pie windings like they did but I can't but I at least want to separate the windings so I got some washers. These are little rubber washers that fit right on top of the uh, right on top of the uh, fiberglass rod and we put those on there and then hit them with a little bit of super glue to keep them in place and then I chucked up the well I drilled holes in, in each end of the choke of course so I could put my wires in and roughed up the wire so it would be a kind of a friction fit for now once the choke is done then I hit it with some super glue but um, you know you, you put the washers on there glue them up and do your winding with your with your regular uh, cordless drill. It took it took maybe a half hour after everything was all set on here with the super glue to build this choke. So if you want to do your own, you certainly can. You don't have to pay those big prices for the RF chokes. Radio frequency chokes are a special class of inductors that are used specifically to isolate RF alternating current between two parts of your circuit. They stop RF. They are specifically made to present a high impedance to RF while allowing DC and low frequency AC signals to pass through unaffected. They're typically low Q devices and are not well suited for use in sharply tuned circuits or as RF filter components. Some, of you, some people use them that way, but that's not really what they're designed to do. Ordinary high Q, low DC resistance coils are the inductors of choice for narrowband and uh, sharply tuned circuits, sharp filters, and so on. Chokes act like ordinary inductors below their self-resonant frequency, or SRF. That is, their impedance is defined by the inductant, inductive reactance formula. The SRF is caused by the choke's inductance interacting with the various capacitances between the windings and layers in the coil, thus forming a tuned circuit. You might have seen some of the fancy winds that reduce the capacitance between the turns. We can't really do that in our homemade chokes. At best, we usually do a, a single layer solenoid or a back and forth type solenoid. Occasionally, you'll see some people doing some scramble winds or some fancy winding. Wideband systems typically want the choke 
to be operated in a predictable region. That means a region well below the uh, self-resonant frequency. Some people say to be 5 to 10 times below that SRF if you want the coil to, uh, to respect that exabel curve, which is a straight line. Fortunately, we experimenters don't always follow these rules. For instance, a choke such as a common 2.5 millihenry would exhibit an impedance of almost 8, 8K ohms at 500 kilohertz, and the impedance would continue upward, rising through the entire broadcast band until it peaks somewhere around 2 to 3 megahertz. This is fine for many circuits, but if you were building a circuit that demanded a very high impedance at 500 kilohertz, like 20K, uh, for instance, there's these competition grade type uh, crystal sets or regens, uh, you might do better with a larger value like 4.7 or 6.8 millihenries uh, if you're uh, interested in the broadcast band. What happens at the self-resonant frequency? As you approach that SRF, the curve representing effective impedance deviates sharply upward from the ideal exabel curve. The choke is said to be resonant at this point. Resonance is the condition where the capacitive and inductive reactances cancel each other out. To make things more complicated, there's both a parallel and a series SRF, or self-resonant frequency. When we get above the parallel self-resonant frequency, we will eventually reach the series self-resonant frequency. That means it's going to pass the frequency that you are trying to reject. Instead of presenting a high impedance, it presents simply the DC value of the uh, res resistance of the coil. Uh, so uh, both of these conditions, the peaking of impedance with the parallel resonance, or parallel SRF, and the shorting in the series SRF uh, can cause problems in your circuit. The parallel condition is harmless. It's actually even beneficial to a low power system, like in a receiver or in a narrowband bias T or someplace where you really want a high impedance. So a lot of people operate right at the SRF for these circuits. But let's say we had that same choke in a high power transmitter, like our plate choke. That peaking effect would act just like a Tesla coil, stepping up the AC voltage for a magnificent zorch. <laughs> Similarly, the series uh, SRF can cause the entire RF power to suddenly be shunted into the RFC, causing a small, slightly embarrassing fire in the PA cage of your transmitter. Now, just beyond the SRF, the phase suddenly flips and the dominant reactance becomes capacitive, not inductive. And the presented impedance begins to track back down. The RF circuit does not discriminate on the kind of reactance that's presented to it. It doesn't care if it's X sub C or X sub L. So at that one frequency it's tuned to, the RF performance is simply affected by impedance. Think of impedance R, L, and C as being no more than a resistive value at one frequency. You will find that the impedance stays very high, well above the self-resonant frequency, at least until you hit that series SRF. But both of those have secondary responses, harmonic responses in, in a way. Uh, the series SRF will repeat on the odd harmonics, and, this, and the uh, fundamental parallel SRF will have a second and a fourth, and so on. So uh, you do a little bit of math, and you find out that you're going to have some bad spots. Uh, our friend, the 2.5 millihenry choke, which had a, uh, let's say it had a first parallel SRF at 2.4 megahertz, and a first series SRF at 2.6 megahertz. We'd better pay attention to bands around 4.8, 7.8, 9.6, this is why in high power 160 to 10 meter uh, amplifiers, the plate chokes don't look anything like our 2.4 millihenry choke. They try to keep the SRF in a place uh, where you're going to get a reasonable impedance down at 160 
you need a few K. Uh, but uh, you're not having those parallel or series resonances in a handband. Now this used to be around 23 or 24 megahertz, but then we did this crazy thing with the WARC bands, so we had to move the sweet spot up to the CB band. Thank heavens we don't have that CB band anymore, because that's a great spot to put our self-resonant frequencies. Here's the other thing we can do. We can take our grid dip meter, and we can look for resonances. You just go up, up through the frequencies that you're going to operate the choke at, and you look to see if you're getting any dips. Let's see if we can get the parallel uh, SRF, and we're doing this with the choke open. Okay, I've got a pretty good, pretty good dip going at about 3.6 megahertz. Don't see any more. I will check lower just to make sure there isn't one below, but I doubt there's one lower than that. Let's take a quick peek. No, that's just the meter. Nope, so 3.6 megahertz, so there would be at one up around 7 point something. So let us get the next parallel. SRF. Very hard to detect. I'm not getting it. Ah, oh, there it is. There it is, just below 8. So that's the second parallel SRF. Okay, the next possible one would be at 16. Around 16, right? Yeah, I'm just not picking it up. So, this is tough duty, trying to find SRFs with a, uh, a grid dip oscillator. Let's try the standard 2.5. See, what Okay, we see. we've got the 2.5. Let's look for the uh, parallel SR first SRF. Okay. There it is right there. Looks like about 2.4. That's not surprising. So let's look for the uh, resonance on the little uh, 100 microenry uh, choke. And it looks like we have the uh, parallel resonance coming in uh, about 6.6 .6 or 6.7 megahertz on that choke. So when we were just casually uh, trying to look for the parallel SRFs using the grid dip oscillator, um, you know, that worked okay. But if we want to investigate more closely, or we want to look for the series resonances, which I think are more important to us, we need a test setup where we can use a generator and some type of instrument like a RMS voltmeter or a scope to be able to look at the the, the peaks and the valleys and uh, determine the parallel and series resonance. Okay, uh, we have a little test set up here. I'd like to show you basically we're coming out of the hot side of the generator's output going through the choke into a uh, resistor to ground. So it's a voltage divider with the choke on top and the resistor on the bottom. This is a 150 ohm resistor. Really anything from 50 to maybe 560 ohms depending on how sensitive your meter or scope is, because you've got to develop enough voltage to see what you're doing. Uh, we are looking for series and parallel resonances in the choke. And we know that if the choke is series resonant, it's going to go low impedance, and the voltage will go up. And if the choke is parallel resonant, it's going to dip, 
and the voltage is going to go down. So let's just scan around looking at our scope. Look at some of these frequencies. We've got a definite peak right here and we're reading 5.62 megahertz. So that would be the primary series resonant frequency of this choke. So the 2.4, uh, 2.5 millihenry choke has a series resonance at around 5.6 megahertz. We know that the parallel resonance is, resonance is lower, so we should probably see a a situation where it it dips and there there's a good one and I'm reading about 2.7 megahertz it's funny because on the grid dip meter we were getting a little lower response 2.4 so uh, <laughs> which one's more accurate I don't know but you can interestingly see on the scope as you go through the parallel resonance you can actually see the phase flip isn't that interesting so here's our homemade choke and uh, we can uh, sweep the broadcast band with it and you will see that it's quite well behaved. It's doing what you'd expect it to do following the uh, exabel curve. It gets more reactive and of course the voltage goes down because we're talking about a voltage divider. Let's go up to the, sex to the next band. Okay, keeps going. And there we go. We definitely found the parallel resonance it's around 2.6 megahertz and there is right after it a series resonance at around 3.1 megahertz and there's another response coming up so let's go back down here there's another resonance spot at 6.9 that's a series resonance Immediately followed by a parallel resonance, 7.8. So this choke, of course, being homemade, it's got some responses that are a lot more complex. There's a response at 6.9, which says it's a series resonance. There's a dip around 7.7, .7, which says that's a parallel resonance. So there's a lot of interesting things happening with that choke. Okay, this is not a highly sophisticated uh, test setup, but as you can see, we have the uh, the 2.5 millihenry choke, and uh, we have a 10k resistor that's uh, being fed directly from the generator's output. It's coming off the the center pin of the connector, and it's going into the the choke, and then the other side of the choke goes to ground, and. Uh, we're going to look for the peaking action of the tuned circuit that we've made. Now, the question is, how big a capacitor should we use uh, to resonate the choke? And, of course, we want to avoid the self-resonant frequency, so we need to go lower. And that's a, that's a big hint. When you're measuring these larger chokes, you want to measure at a low enough frequency that you're not being disturbed by the capacitance that's inherent in the in the choke. So I picked a 470 picofarad ceramic disc high Q capacitor and I know that's going to resonate the choke at a low enough frequency that I shouldn't be disturbed. Now I can use either my RMS voltmeter to look for a peak or I can use my scope. So as I wiggle the frequency around we will see there is a peak and uh, that peak is coinciding with the frequency here of 140 kilohertz. Okay, 140 kilohertz. So let's see how that works with our formula to back into the inductance of this choke. So I don't know about you guys, but I'm always very impressed at those math guys, you know, they can just write out formulas and write in front of you and they don't make mistakes or, or when they make mistakes they just uh, they turn it into a teaching moment or something. Wow, I got crickets going in here. I guess the crickets are interested in ninth grade algebra. 
So let's just work this out. Square root LC equals 1. And then uh, square root LC equals 1 over 2 pi F. And we've got to square stuff, right? LC equals 1 over 2 pi F squared. So L equals 1 over 2 pi F squared divided by what happened to C? Did we lose C somewhere? <laughs> oh, there he is. Okay. L equals 1 over 2 pi F squared over C. Let's see what we can do with that. Okay, so we have uh, 1 over 6.28 times 140 kilohertz, that's 140E3, divided by 470 picofarads, that's 470E minus 12. And then we have to square that up there, get the order of operations right, and we come out with 2.73 millihenries. That seems a little bit high. Um, it maybe is that high, but I probably believe that maybe we got the capacitor not quite measured. So you always want to measure your capacitors. And there's going to be some errors in there, but that certainly gets us in the ballpark. We think this is a 2.5 millihenry choke. There's even a more primitive uh, formula where you got to square things and get the order of operations right or the whole thing blows up. But that formula also works. Now we have our homemade choke. Uh, it's used, uh, using the number 32 wire, and I've got the 470 cap hooked in as best I can. And again, we are going to sweep and look for the peak on the meter. Okay, let's read the frequency. 225, so that's 225 kilohertz. So our homemade choke is coming out at 1.06 millihenries. So there's a couple things about this choke. Uh, uh, first of all, you can see they've got the rather heavy wire wrapped around the uh, ferrite core. So this is probably uh, most useful as a, a power supply a filter choke, like in the AC line or maybe in a DC line up to, uh, oh, probably five or six amps. Um, winding the enameled wire directly on the ferrite is going to add capacitance. So I'm going to put a layer of Kapton tape around the ferrite and build it up a little bit. And then we're going to wind uh, some finer wire on there. Okay, so I took our 100 microhenry choke and I put a couple layers, maybe three layers of Kapton tape on it. And I took some number 32 wire, 34 wire I think. And uh, I went up and down about three times. So there's about three layers of wire on here. It's not really that much. So let's see if this changed the SRF. It should go down. So I've got the, uh, the 3.2 to 6.6 in. And let's see. There we go. Yeah, we're getting a dip uh, around 4.4. Let's see if we can measure that. Drag a couple into it. Oh, there, well, there we are. Right around 10 and a half. Of course, I'm probably too close. I'm probably influencing it. We forgot about our 100 microhenry Radio Shack core that we put uh, three layers of Kapton tape on and wrapped on three layers of uh, number 32 wire. And uh, believe it or not, it's coming out at 218 kilohertz. 
we don't even need to calculate this one because uh, it's almost identical to the other choke and that's just coincidence. So this one is also just a little bit over a millihenry and uh, both of those homemade chokes would work very well. Um, they would have uh, significant reactants uh, for uh, oscillators in the broadcast band all the way up through um, you know some of the shortwave. So those are acceptable chokes to use for most of the projects uh, most of the receiver type projects that, that we do. Now if you want more inductance of course we would have to put more turns on. But it's fairly simple to make your own chokes and uh, get uh, decent performance out of them. Okay, do you guys remember the Booten RX meter or RX bridge? If we want to use that, um, we have to uh, respect some of the rules that we've been learning about uh, self-resonant frequency. That is to operate the test equipment at the lowest frequency that you need to to avoid the SRF. In this case, on the RX meter, I'm setting the range to its lowest, which is the 0.5 to 1 megahertz scale. I'm right down at 0.5, so 500 kilohertz is where we're going to test. Let me remove the, the choke. And remember how we, uh, how we do the test. We set it up for 0, 0, 0.00, and infinity on the RP, CPRP. We put our little fingers on there. And then we maximize the detector. There's plenty of response here. Then we wiggle these little guys here to get a null. Once we have the null, we attach the unit under test. Okay, this guy's got really long leads, which drives you crazy. You don't want to cut the leads on a brand new choke, you know. You never know how long you need for leads, right? Okay. So, all we're going to do now is we're going to tune until we get a null. Okay, that's a pretty good null right there. Yeah. Okay. And then we just read it. And it looks like we have 40... Point eight picofarads. Forty point eight. So this video might have got a little out of hand, but uh, learning about uh, RF components that are getting more difficult to find nowadays is uh, is worth the effort. I think that uh, once we move into the next phase of this uh, wireless broadcaster project, uh, that is the oscillator and power amplifier that's in one dual tube here and then the audio uh, microphone amplifier and modulator I think it'll be more interesting to you but for now we've got some homemade chokes we can work with